Good afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about persuasion. If we broadly think of leadership as influencing a group of people towards the accomplishment of a goal, we can clearly see how persuasion fits into that bucket, that we need to persuade people in order to get them to accomplish a goal. So the, the focus of this lecture is really going to be how you talk people into agreeing with you, how you persuade people through verbal means, uh, which is an incredibly important skill. Uh, that's, that's why we're spending so much time on it. That being said, um, convincing people through words is one of the least efficient ways or is the least efficient way to convince people of something. The best way to convince people is to show them, is to demonstrate the validity of your opinion, the value of your idea. Um, there was this philosopher in the 60s named Alan Watts, and he was kind of like a secular Buddhist type dude, and uh, he, he says that he has this like really silly story of this man coming up to you, and he, he believes the world is flat, and whatever evidence you provide to him, he disputes it, he disputes it, he disputes it, because his experience is of a flat world. He wakes up every day, he walks across the ground as if it were flat, he looks towards a flat horizon. To him, the world is flat. That is his experience. And you cannot talk someone out of their experience. So instead, what you gotta do is you gotta pick a spot and you gotta start, you gotta pick a spot, you gotta pick a direction, and you gotta start walking in that direction. And you keep walking, you, you swim across oceans, you go up mountains, you go across deserts, and you keep walking in the exact same direction without ever turning. And eventually, you're going to get back to the same point that you started. You're going to walk around the world and come back to the same point. And then, then he will believe you because he's experienced it. And again, I know that that's a bit of a tortured metaphor, but the main idea that I want you to take away from that is that yes you can talk people into believing things but it's so much easier to show them so whenever you need to convince someone of something before you start taking um uh like maybe uh approaching them in not not an argumentative way but in a persuasive way um first ask yourself is there a way i can demonstrate the validity of my opinion or demonstrate the value of what i believe that is the best way to convince people Now, sometimes we do need to convince people through talking, and our usual approach is not very good. Um, when you're arguing with your relatives about politics at the holidays, you know, that's, that's not an effective way of actually changing people's minds. And no one's trying to change anyone's minds, right? They're just enjoying arguing. Um, we change people's minds through conversation, not confrontation. That means that when you are arguing with someone, it's both people trying to prove they're right and it's neither side listening to the other. And once you get in that position of argumentation, of confrontation, you can just stop and take a step back because you've already lost that opportunity to change the person's mind. You can only change people's minds through conversation, not confrontation. This is one of my favorite quotes from someone I strongly disagreed with in a lot of instances, and that's Justice Scalia. And uh, he says, attack, I, I attack ideas, I don't attack people. And some very good people have some very bad ideas. There is a very big difference between saying, I disagree with you about immigration policy and saying you're racist. One is attacking ideas, the other is attacking people. And you need to do the first one of those. You need to attack ideas. You cannot attack people. People are open to the idea that, that what they believe is wrong. They're not open to the idea that they're bad people. You're never going to convince someone that they're a bad person, right? Everyone justifies what they do. So you can convince them that they have a bad idea. You can attack their ideas. But if you attack them, they're immediately going to get defensive and you're never going to convince them uh, from, that your point of view is correct. A big aspect of persuasion for me is assuming best intentions. So what I mean by that is assume that the person you're talking to is an intelligent, well-intentioned, good person. And that this person, through their intellect, through caring about other people, has come to a conclusion very different than yours. And that, that your goal is try to try to understand how could an intelligent, well-meaning person see the world in such a different way from me. That, that's really the first step of persuasion, is assuming that the person is acting out of good intentions and try to understand um, how their good intentions could lead them to the decision that they've made. 
Today we're going to talk about four aspects of persuasion. The first step in persuasion is to listen. We often try to convince people by talking, but if we want to convince people, the first thing we need to do is listen to them. We're going to talk about highlighting areas of agreement. We'll talk about stating what we believe and how to do that. And finally, we'll talk about being patient. All right, let's talk about listening. If you were in a debate tournament, would you rather go first or last? Last, of course. Everyone would rather go last in a, in a debate because that way you get to hear the other person's arguments before you make your own. Now, let me ask you, how many times in real life do you give away that primary position by trying to argue your point before you've thoroughly listened to the other person's perspective? I bet in real life, maybe 99 times out of 100, when you're trying to convince someone of something, you start out by telling them what you believe instead of listening to what they believe. And by doing so, you're giving up the prime spot in the debate. Uh, you want to listen to the person before you make your case because you want to understand their argument. We've talked a lot and practiced a lot uh, the six elements of listening in this course. So we talked about listening to understand, asking open-ended questions, observing nonverbals, using minimal reinforcers, embracing silence, and restating the message. So we're gonna go through each of these again and how specifically to utilize them within a uh, persuasion scenario. So begin by listening with a non-judgmental attitude. There are two reasons to uh, listen with a non-judgmental attitude. Number one, we don't want to make the other person defensive, right? Uh, we've talked a lot about how if you're judgmental of people, if you're critical, they get defensive. So by being non-judgmental, we, we help ensure that other people won't get defensive. That's the first reason. The second reason that you should begin by listening with a non-judgmental attitude is go into every argument assuming that you could be wrong you might be wrong. So you should listen to the other person. All right, so we, uh, by being non-judgmental, by being non-critical, by being open to the other person's perspective, uh, by focusing on their ideas and not the person themselves, uh, we can ensure that the other person doesn't get defensive as we're talking to them. So the first reason you need to uh, begin by listening with a non-judgmental attitude is so you don't make the other person uh, defensive. The other reason that you need to listen with a non-judgmental attitude uh, is because you might be wrong. And there's an old saying that being influenceable is the key to being influential, which means that if you expect or want someone to open up their mind and be willing to change their opinion uh, based on the merits of your argument, then you need to open up your mind and be willing to change your opinion based on the merits of their argument. That it can't be a one-way street. That if you are gonna try to persuade someone of something, you have to be open to persuasion as well. And you should quit looking at persuasion as uh, that the, the success of being persuasive is your idea being adopted. The success of being persuasive is finding the best idea. And that might be your idea, it might not. So you're probably wrong a lot. <laughs> I consider myself a pretty bright person and I, I'm i probably wrong 60% of the time. God, probably 75% of the time. If I ever get down to only being wrong half of the time, I that's my life goal. I think that is true genius to only be wrong half the time we're wrong because we get lied to a lot for some reason i don't know about you but when i was in junior high we were talking about columbus they were like man columbus was this visionary genius uh everyone thought the world was flat and columbus was you know bold and courageous and he knew the world was round that whole story is is bs that um educated people have known that the world is round since about three thousand years ago Every educated person in Columbus's time knew the world was round. No one thought the world was flat. Um, so yeah, we, we just get told these stories. It makes a good story, but it's not actually true. Um, same thing if you've ever heard that uh, Einstein failed math when he was a kid. That's not true. He was always a mathematical prodigy. Um, oh, or that carrots are good for your vision. That is not true. That is a lie started by the British during World War II. Um, because they didn't want the Germans to know they had discovered radar. So we're probably wrong a lot because there's just a lot of misinformation floating around in our lives and we're not always as critical about the information that goes into our, into our minds as, as we possibly should be. Uh, there's an old saying that keep an open mind but not to open your brain falls out. So be open to other people's ideas but uh, that doesn't mean that you have to believe everything that you hear. 
So we, uh, the first thing we do to persuade someone is to listen to them. Uh, that that uh, prevents them from being defensive, and because we might be wrong, we need to hear their argument because it might be more persuasive than ours. The next ask, ask, aspect of listening is asking open-ended questions, and uh, we'll talk about how to apply that specifically to persuasion. So in the context of persuasion, we want to use open-ended questions to discover what people believe and why they believe it. Let's say, hypothetically, you think wealth inequality is a big problem in the United States. And so you see there in the upper left, we have a chart showing what the actual wealth inequality in the United States is. However, this chart on the bottom uh, right shows what people think the wealth distribution in America is. And so uh, we can't convince people or, or in order to convince people that wealth inequality is a problem, we need to understand how they're seeing the world and we have to ensure that they're seeing the world accurately. If someone perceives the wealth distribution as it is in the bottom right and they say that there's not a problem with wealth inequality, well, that might make sense given their perception of the world. So people's conclusions usually make sense given their perceptions of the world. So what's important is understanding their subjective perceptions. How do they see the world around them? The next thing you wanna understand is what is people's ideal situation? Do they want total equality? Do they think that a certain level of inequality is acceptable? How much inequality is acceptable? Um, you wanna understand what people's ideals are. And this is probably the hardest thing to change people's minds about. Ideals really get to the core of a person. They get down to what they value. So um, a lot of the differences between conservatives and liberals can come down to the fact that these people have very different values. Conservatives tend to value individual freedom and um, liberals tend to value fairness, equality. Uh, and so if you look at every debate between liberals and conservatives as a debate about individual freedom versus fairness or individual freedom versus social support, um, then it starts to make a lot more sense. So you have to understand what people's ideals are, what their values are, um, before you can convince them of things. And it's very hard to convince people that their values are wrong. The last thing you want to use open-ended questions to explore is how do we get from point A to point B? How do we get from the current situation to the ideal situation? And even if we agree on what the current situation is and what the ideal situation should be, we might still disagree on how to get there. Uh, so for example, a conservative might argue that it's actually government regulation that is leading to this inequality. And by having uh, more deregulated markets, that will just inevitably create equity or e equitability. Um, a liberal might argue that, no, 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 we need more government intervention. So even if we agree on how things are and where they should be, we can still disagree on how to get there. So we ask open-ended questions to explore how people perceive the current situation, what is their ideal situation, and how do we get from the current situation to the ideal situation. All right, so the first thing we want to understand is what people believe. The next thing we want to understand is why do they believe it? Traditionally, there are three, ra three ways of looking at why people believe what they believe. Logos, which is logic, pathos, which is emotion, and ethos, which is authority. Logos is when you believe something because it makes sense intellectually or logically. Uh, I drive a silver Honda CRV, and uh, one time this guy asked me what kind of car I drive, and I said a silver Honda CRV, and he said, "Oh, that's the most boring car in the world," and I said, "Yeah, exactly, uh, because that's what I love about my car, right?" He says, "Boring, I think low maintenance, dependable, cheap. That's what I like about it." Um, when I was buying a car, I had a criteria, a list of things that I wanted uh, for the activities that I enjoy. So I wanted something with enough cargo space for camping. I wanted something with all-wheel drive so I could take it skiing. Uh, and then cheap and dependable. Um, that's why I bought my car. The CRV ticked those boxes. Logically, it made sense for me to buy that car. Logically, that car matched with what my expectations were. So that's Logos, is logic. Uh, the next reason people believe what they believe is pathos and that's emotion so i bought my crv out of logic i bought my motorcycle out of pathos um when i tell people i drive a motorcycle they go oh don't you know that's dangerous and i go yeah that's why i bought it 
Um, I didn't buy a motorcycle because I was like, oh, this is a thoughtful decision financially and for my health. I bought a motorcycle because I rode a mo motorcycle and was like, that is fun. I want to do that more. It was a completely emotional decision. Terrorism utilizes pathos. When terrorists blow up a bus full of civilians, people aren't like, oh, that's a well-reasoned argument. They, uh, it, it's, they're trying to scare people out of it, right? That if you go to war with us, we're going to kill your children um, or whatever it is. If you take the stance, we're going to kill your children. And it's trying to scare people uh, out, of their, out of their perspective, not logic them out of it. Um, so we really look down upon pathos in Western society, which I have a lot of, I, I think it's bad that we look down upon it. Um, but in reality, almost all of our beliefs and de decisions involve some element of pathos. And I would go so far as to say most of your small decisions throughout the day are made almost entirely for emotional reasons. Um, big, big picture stuff were better about kind of intellectually planning things out. But but day to day when we're, we're in the thick of it, we're often just driven by our instincts, by our emotions. Um, let me give you an example. I don't know anything about wine. So whenever I go to a uh, potluck and people are like, oh, bring a bottle of wine, you know, I'll go to Whole Foods and I'll pick the price range that I want. And then, uh, I'll just, I'll pick based on which one has the coolest label, right? I'll pick based on which one has the emotional appeal to me. Um, and I know that seems really silly, but that's the reason they spend so much money on label design or why there are so many cool different bottles to put whiskey in. Uh, people are, are, are drawn to these things. It creates an emotional reaction, which guides our decisions. Um, when people suffer damage to the emotional part of their brain, they have trouble with these types of day-to-day -day decisions. They can still make big decisions like, where should I invest my 401k money? Because that's a logically driven decision. Um, and they're bad at making these day-to-day -day decisions because they're not going to sit there and compare every, you know, 15 different bottles of wine to figure out which one actually logically is the best. You need to make a gut decision at some point. Logos is logic, pathos is emotion. The next thing we'll talk about is ethos and that's authority. So in business, we refer to ethos as branding. Uh, if you ever buy, you know, uh, a North Face jacket because you think North Face is a good brand, that's ethos. You, you haven't looked into the jacket specifically, but uh, um, North Face has this reputation for being a high quality product. So that's what you buy. One of the most common examples of ethos is peer pressure. Uh, do it because everyone else does it. The authority of the crowd. Um, ethos can arise because you like someone. So we don't think that Beyonce has any special uh, uh, palate powers where she's really good at deciding what is the best soda. We like Beyonce, so we go, oh, Beyonce likes Pepsi? I should like Pepsi. Uh, ethos can also arise from culture. So, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago when gay marriage was a very controversial topic in the United States, a lot of the people who were against gay marriage um, would argue that they're, I'm, I'm for traditional marriage. Um, they weren't arguing that traditional marriage was better. They were just saying it's traditional. Um, so that would be an example of ethos. They're appealing to the authority of culture, the, the authority of tradition. And then lastly, ethos can arise from expertise. So um, I understand climate change in the very broadest way. If you come and challenge me about climate change, I, I cannot probably win that argument. Um, but I don't care because there are 97% of climate scientists believe in climate change and believe that it's caused by humans. So that's good enough for me. I'm not going to take all the time to, to figure out climate science, to read all the academic journal articles. I mean, it would literally, I would have to devote my entire life to understanding climate science and I'm not going to do it. What I'm going to do is say, hey, there's someone way smarter than me who studied this way more than me, and they think that climate change is a real thing and that it's caused by humans. I'm going to defer to their authority. Uh, anytime you take your car into a mechanic, you are deferring to authority based on expertise, right? Um, you're not going to argue with your mechanic about what needs to be done to your car. You're going to believe their opinion. You're paying them for their opinion. You're paying them for their ethos, for their expertise. So uh, the first thing we want to figure out is uh, what people believe, and then we want to figure out why they believe it. And people usually have three reasons for believing what they believe. Logos, which is logic, pathos, which is emotion, and ethos, which is authority. 
Now, I, I've presented this in a way where it's like clean cut, right? Where it's like, oh, people believe this because of logos or pathos or ethos. In reality, we often have very complex reasons for believing what we believe. And our beliefs are usually based on a, a web of um, ethos, pathos, and logos. So I use the example of buying my CRV as, as a logical decision. And it was largely a logical decision, but it was also an ethos decision. I'd heard very good things about Honda uh, it, as a good brand. And so there was an aspect of branding of ethos there. Um, so it wasn't just logos. It was these other things driving it. Um, oh, and there was pathos as well. Like a lot of it was, I, I haven't taken my CRV skiing once. Um, I bought a car that I could take skiing because I had so much fun skiing when I, with all my friends when I was in Colorado and I haven't done that since I moved out to California. Uh, but that idea of it was a very much emotional draw to buying a car that could, um, uh, that I could take skiing. It's got all wheel drive. It's a beast. All right, so uh, we listen to understand the other person's perspective because we don't want to make them defensive and we could be wrong. We ask open-ended uh, open questions to flesh out what they believe and why they believe it. Uh, we observe nonverbal. So uh, we want to understand people's emotional reaction to whatever they're talking about so we can address that. Uh, if this is a topic that makes them angry or sad or excited or scared, that's something we wanna pay attention to. Uh, it'll definitely help us hone in on where that pathos is when they believe something because of emotion. You have to be able to connect to people emotionally before you can connect to them intellectually, which means that uh, you have to understand the emotions that drive their beliefs and their opinions. I used to be very judgmental and dismissive of anti-vaxxers. I felt that they were being ignorant and through their ignorance, they were not putting themselves at risk. They were putting their children at risk who were too immature to make this decision for themselves. And they were also putting other people's children um, who have compromised immune systems and aren't able to get vaccines for that reason. They're putting them at risk by exposing them to all these diseases. And uh, one morning I was listening to NPR and they were interviewing this mother who had uh, chosen not to vaccinate her children. And I just, for whatever reason that morning, it just clicked with me for the first time. And as they were interviewing this woman, you could hear the, the absolute terror in her voice, the fear that she was going to make a decision that would end up permanently injuring, altering, damaging her child that she was gonna be responsible for this permanent negative change in her child. And she was so terrified of that, that she was willing to risk whooping cough or measles or whatever it was. And I, I had always been so judgmental and dismissive. And then hearing this woman and realizing that this decision was coming out of a place of, this is my child and I'm going to protect them. That I can understand, right? That is a very reasonable, understandable thing. And when, when you understand that that's the perspective that they're coming from, that they're trying to protect their child and that they see this as a threat to their child's health, then their decision makes sense in light of that emotion. But you have to understand it from an emotional perspective before you can understand it from an intellectual one because intellectually that decision does not make sense. All right, so we observe nonverbal so that we can connect people emotionally because we need to connect them emotionally before we can connect to them uh, intellectually. We have to understand emotionally what they're going through and what they're coming from uh, if we want to understand what they believe and why they believe it. We want, uh, also want to use minimal reinforcers. Uh, minimal reinforcers are just, we're just showing them that we're paying attention, right? And to embrace silence. Embracing silence is especially important in persuasion because oftentimes when we disagree with people, we're just letting them talk, but we're really just waiting. We're rehearsing our argument in our own mind and just waiting for them to pause so we can hop in and disagree with them. Uh, don't do that. Like if they pause, uh, embrace the silence, give them an opportunity to kind of like sit in that silence and um, that, that will show that you're not just waiting to pounce on them. You're actually considering what they're saying. And lastly, we want to use restatements. So restatements serve a very specific function in persuasion and, and they're very, very useful tactic in persuasion. The first function they serve is to clarify the speaker's point. Um, restatements 
help to make sure that you're actually understanding the other person. I can't tell you how many arguments I've avoided since I started using restatements. So many arguments are due to miscommunication and not due to an actual difference in opinion or beliefs. Uh, people have just expressed themselves ambiguously or you have uh, misunderstood them. Um, so many conflicts are created by miscommunication. So by using restatements, you're making sure that you understand the other person's perspective uh, before you start trying to uh, challenge them on it. And then, uh, as always, uh, restatements serve to let the uh, speaker know that you're paying attention. So the, the first part of persuasion is really getting to a point where you can explain to the other person, okay, it sounds like you believe blank because of blank. That's really what, what the first step in being persuasive is, to listen to the other person, ask open-ended questions, and get to the point where you can say, this is what you believe and this is why you believe it. And then you can move on to the next part of persuasion. There's also a nefarious reason to use restatements when you're uh, disagreeing with someone. Sometimes you will disagree with people and they are arguing with you in bad faith. And every time you kind of show them that they're wrong, they change their position. And it is an incredibly frustrating thing to do. When you use restatements, you lock people into a position. You say, you believe this because of this. And then you, they, you're no longer chasing a moving target. They, they, you've locked them into that argument and that's what you have to dispute. All right, so first part of persuasion is listening, and we talked about how to use the six tools of effective listening, specifically in a persuasion situation. So we listen to understand the other person's perspective because uh, it will prevent them from being defensive and also because we might be wrong. We ask open-ended questions to figure out what they believe and why they believe it. We observe nonverbals uh, to pay attention to people's emotional reaction to their beliefs. We have to connect to them emotionally before we can connect to them intellectually. We use minimal reinforcers to let the other person know we're listening. We embrace silence to show them that we're not just waiting to pounce with our uh, opinion, that we're actually considering what they're saying. And then we use restatements to clarify the speaker's point of view and make sure that we, do, we actually disagree with each other and we're not just miscommunicating with each other. So that is step one in persuasion is to listen. Step two is to highlight areas of agreement. So often when we argue, we highlight areas of disagreement, right? When we're talking to someone about a topic um, and there's an aspect of it we disagree about, we will focus in on the thing we disagree about. Uh, we will exaggerate our positions. We will, we will um, highlight the disagreement. When you're trying to be persuasive, you want to do the exact opposite. You want to find common ground. You want to start by highlighting, hey, we agree on this, we agree on this, we agree on this. And really to build up the idea that we agree on more things than we disagree about. You need to be honest and sincere about the areas you agree on. So, uh, you know, there, there are some instances where we feel like we are just, you know, on, on the opposite ends of the earth with some people uh, about our beliefs. Uh, politics is a good example of this. And uh, during the primaries, um, I was a big Bernie Sanders supporter. You know, shocking, I'm sure. Uh, and one of my good friends is a big Trump supporter. And so we had all these political arguments and stuff. And uh, actually, I was I was making this lecture <laughs> at that time. And I was like, oh, I should actually be applying this. So the next time we started talking about politics, instead of arguing with him and criticizing, I uh, took a different tact. And I said, oh, man, you know, I will say that uh, I really like that Trump doesn't have super PACs because this was back when he was running in the primaries and he didn't have super PACs. I like that he wasn't accepting corporate money in that way. And uh, I also like that he came out and said that the Iraq war was a bad decision, uh, which is kind of against Republican orthodoxy to say, or it was at the time. Um, but that's I agreed with that. So, you know, I was like, those are the two things that I really like about the candidate. And and. I wanted to find common ground with him, but it had to be honest and sincere, right? And, it, you know, it when, when we think about talking about what we like about the other side politically, that's so many people are just completely unwilling to even go there. But there is something, I mean, you have to find some level of common ground. There's always something that you can genuinely appreci appreciate about the other person's perspective or opinion. And you need to find that and build on it. 
Now, another thing this does is it exploits the rule of reciprocity. So the rule of reciprocity is one of the most ubiquitous rules of human behavior um, that we have uh, across cultures across time. If someone gives you something, you feel indebted to give them something back. You feel obligated to give them something back. And this holds true everywhere across all times. Uh, if you ever go down to Fisherman's Wharf, which I don't know why you would do that, but if you ever do, uh, there's all these, quote, Buddhist monks, unquote, that are walking around and they, they come up to you and they put a bracelet around your wrist and then they ask for a donation. And this has got to be like, what, a 25 cent flimsy bracelet. Uh, but they give it to you and then you're like, oh man, now I, I have to give them something in return, right? That's the rule of reciprocity. So you can exploit this in persuasion as well because like when I started complimenting Trump, my friend, and I didn't like prompt him to do this, it's just how he naturally responded, he started complimenting Bernie Sanders and saying what he liked about Bernie Sanders as a candidate. Now, what's so great about that is that it is, we, we are our best persuaders, right? So now instead of me trying to force my opinion on him from the outside, he's coming up with his own reasons to agree with me. Um, and that is much more persuasive in the long run than me giving him reasons to agree with me. So we listen to the other person to understand their point of view. Uh, we highlight areas of agreement. We build on common ground instead of focusing on where we're different. And then we state what we believe. So we simply state what we believe and why we believe it. Um, and, and we do it in a way that aligns with the other person's values and criteria. So we need to know what is important to other people. So when we explain our opinion, we can explain it in a way that, um, that, that aligns with what they care about, that makes it personable, personal and meaningful to them. And we don't say it, hey, this is what you should believe or this is the right thing to believe. We just say, hey, this is what I believe. This is my two cents. Uh, I'm not pressuring you to agree with me. I'm just stating my opinion. We listen to understand. We highlight areas of agreement. We state what we believe. And then the last thing we do is be patient. The last, the last aspect of persuasion is being patient. That um, we often... Uh, like we, we go to movies and like someone will come in and make a speech and everyone stands up and cheers and everyone changes their mind because this person is so persuasive. That is an incredibly rare thing in real life. Um, people often take days, weeks, months, years to change their mind about something. Um, and the more you pressure them to, to change their mind, the more defensive they're going to be. And often... Uh, the reason our persuasion efforts fail is because we think of persuasion efforts on a timeline of a conversation, whereas we need to think of persuasion on a timeline of years, where it's really uh, thinking in long term, uh, in thinking about the long term and how you can change people's opinions and perspectives um, and being patient and, and willing to give them time to reflect on things. And that is how you be, that is how you are persuasive. That is how you persuade. Uh, you begin by listening non-judgmentally. Then you highlight areas of agreement. Uh, you build on common ground. You state what you believe very simply. And then you be patient.